Coming to you from sunny California and the Great White North. Get ready. We are breaking down the obstacles on the Armchair Ninja Podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Armchair Ninja Podcast. It is Friday, August 28th, 2017. My name is Rich, and joining me once again this week is Bajan. How are you making out? I'm good, man. I wish I could say that I was better. I'm like literally two weeks away from a competition, dude. And just today at the gym, I completely tweaked my neck like really, really bad where I can barely even move it. So I feel like a robot right now because <laughs> if I turn it just a little bit, I'm in so much pain. Uh, really frustrating, but hopefully I'll be fine by the competition. It's awful. What do you do for something like that? Are you going to be icing it? Or like, how do you how do you recover? I don't I don't get sports injuries, right? My my sports injuries are like carpal tunnel from the remote. <laughs> well, ibuprofen, you know, to um, lay out the inflammation, then just ice pack it, and then um, use heat afterwards. It's it's weird with the ice and the heat, but it works, and I'm just trying my best. Hopefully, I'll be fine, but it's annoying. <laughs> yeah, I bet. So this week on the podcast, we're going to be covering Ultimate Beastmaster episodes seven and eight and Team Ninja Warrior. I, from everything I'm seeing on, online, it's season two still, episode seven. I, I would call this season three personally. It's very confusing to call it season two. Yeah, it's semantics. I don't know. It depends if you consider College Ninja Warrior part of Team Ninja Warrior or not. I think it is. Really? I, I would call it a separate show. But anyway. Regardless, we're going to be covering those, and we're going to be talking a little about a video from Joe Morofsky, or sorry, about Joe Morofsky <laughs> from Whistle Sports. So lots of cool stuff to talk about, so I kind of have to jump into it here pretty quickly. Yeah, let's go, man. We got a lot of cover, but I must say, all right off the bat, fantastic night if you're a obstacle course fan. Some good shows, man. Yeah, yeah, not a weak episode among them. We'll start with Team Ninja Warrior because that's the that's the big one right now. Yeah, don't bury the lead. Let's go. Yeah, so we've got the Mega Crushers versus Team Tarzan and Team TNT versus the Wings to kick it all off. So the Mega Crushers. Those team names fail so bad. <laughs> oh my god. Those Mega are Crushers so bad. is a good name. Mega Crushers is awful, dude. Uh, I don't agree at all. Okay, when you think Mega Crushers, what are, what do you think in your head? I'm thinking Megan Martin now. No, you don't. As soon as she said Megan Martin Mega Crusher, you might have made the connection, but that that team is name is terrible, absolutely terrible. It doesn't implement Ian Dory at all. Or <laughs> yeah, where's the Wolf Pack? Wouldn't it make a lot more sense to like just call it the Wolf Pack for God's sakes? Dan Yeager's even part of that. Yeah, I'm I'm just I'm I'm trying to think like what did they think of when they thought Mega Crushers, but. I don't know. That's just one. I mean, the wings is also equally as terrible, and there there is just some bad names, guys. The wings is awful. I have to agree. There had to be a genie thing in there somewhere. Come on. Yeah, you need you need a genie reference or something. That's so much better. All right. Well, let's get on to it. Um, one big thing is is that they switched out the uh, the penultimate obstacle, right? Just like they did last season, and they got the bungee cords, and I actually really like that that switch up because I love the bungee cords. It, it's so, like, they make it look easy, man, but though that is such a hard obstacle. Right into that bungee bridge thing, that's a tough one. That dismount was brutal. Like, we saw that right off the bat. Let's get into the matchup here. We got Mega Crushers, Megan Martin, Ian Dory, and Dan Yeager versus Team Tarzan. That is a terrible name. Ben Melick, Travis Winand, and Rose Wetzel. Those are some really good competitors on each team. I mean, I was really looking up to this matchup, and they didn't disappoint. Did it go how you expected? And we ended up jumping to the end a little bit, but with the clean sweep from the uh, the Mega Crushers, is that how you thought it would go, or you thought it would be closer? Uh, I mean, <laughs> it's the Mega Crushers. It's, it's the Wolf Pack. So it's really hard to bet against them. But I have to say, you know, Team Tarzan put up a really good fight, but I wasn't. I can't say I was surprised. How about you? Not really. But Team Ninja Warrior is full of surprises all the time. So, you know, it wouldn't have been too surprising for me, I guess, if they didn't end up doing it. I, I was a little surprised at the clean sweep. I really thought uh, Travis's reach was going to play a bigger part, but he couldn't seem to make very good use of it, especially on the bungees where you think that would have been the biggest advantage. I mean, it, it comes all down to experience and he's not as experienced as the other competitors even though he isn't like a he isn't a newbie at the to this at all but he's a going against three really tough veterans that train on obstacles all the time so 
you know, I <laughs> it, it's hard for for this poor guy to compete against the likes of Dan Yeager and Ian Dory and stuff. But I, I got to say, Dan Yeager, man, he came to play this episode. Yeah, he did really well. Uh, and so did Megan Martin. Like, no surprise. She just hasn't failed yet. She has won every single race. She's continued her streak from last year. Yeah, yeah. She's she's been really good at that and kind of low key because I I have to admit I forgot the fact that she was clean sweeping it last season. So, I I'm curious if that's going to play a major port um story point going on maybe in later seasons. I literally mentioned that last week. You weren't listening to me at all. I I never listened to you, bro. Yeah. All right. So, <laughs> It was it was a good matchup. Ian actually destroyed Ben Me like he ab- oh boy. just crushed that whole course. Made the dismount look easy that everybody was struggling on. Megan did eventually do the dismount, but even she was having trouble with it at first. So that made a clean sweep for the Mega Crushers, as we said. Awesome start to the whole thing. Great matchups, two strong teams. And then we get to see the Wings versus Team TNT. Now, TNT changed from last season. They were second place, but really... Travis is the only guy that's back. That was shocking to me because Team TNT was so strong, you know? Like, they made it to the end, and going into that matchup, I thought they were going to win the entire show. I mean, they were a big surprise to me. So I was shocked when I actually when we actually got a look at the team, and I, I had to do a double take. I'm like, the, was that the team last year? And then they, <laughs> they sure enough, they're like, oh, no, just Travis Rosen's, like, left. But... I don't know. I was at, at first I was like a question mark about his team, but boy did they impress. I mean, I have to say this team might even be more impressive than last year, dude. Yeah. Yeah, I think Mary Beth's definitely uh, uh doing better than Joyce did last year. Uh Joyce Chavaz. I don't actually even remember who the guy was that ran with them, do you? Uh, Brett Sims is doing fantastic this year. Whoever it was, Brett definitely holding up his end. Yeah, I mean, Brett is just next level and I'm really glad to see him on the show because he's one of those competitors that you always see him on A&W but he doesn't really I, <laughs> I guess this might be a theme but he's one of those competitors that isn't shown in the light that all the other competitors are and yet he's so high level and he really like came out to play and one thing I, I must say is that a show like Team Ninja Warrior there are certain athletes that really stand out a whole lot more on the show in relativity towards American Ninja Warrior. And I must say, Travis Rosen, Brett Sims, uh, competitors like this really stand out far more on Team Ninja Warrior. And I'm really glad they get time to time to shine. And I am really high up on them. I mean, this team is going to be a force in the finals. Oh, did I just spoil things? Anyways, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> well, if you're listening to us, I'm, I imagine you guys have already seen it, guys. But... I, I must say, I mean, I'm really high up on this team. It's great to see somebody like Travis, you know, my age, doing so well on the course. That cannot be understated, man. Travis, um, relative towards everybody else, he is a lot older, and he is so fast. Yeah, they they mentioned that he was almost twice the age of Thomas, and I thought, that can't be right. And then I realized Thomas is 21, 22. Yeah, yeah, he's basically twice his age. That's crazy. Yeah, Thomas is a baby still, and... uh that, that's crazy, but not just that. I mean, when you look at Thomas Stillings' team, the Wings, I mean, th- that team just exudes youth, do- don't they? Yeah, they kind of do, don't they? I mean, we get David Yarder, whose claim to fame, if you want to call it that, is that he was part of the father-son team that qualified for her finals. They were the first, or the only father-son team to ever do that. So yeah, that, I mean, that kind of puts him in a young light as well. And Melanie in her rookie debut, actually, all this whole team is rookies. This is all their first times in Team Ninja Warrior. So, uh, yeah, I think it would be fair to say that they were the uh, the rookie sensation. And then you've got the Team TNT, which was known for being the, the veterans last year. Yeah, team. when you look at the median age between these two teams, I mean, it is drastic. But once again, I mean... It, when you look at the the team of the wings, which is just a terrible name, I can't get over it every time I see even say it on my mouth. When team you, Genie, yeah, I'll just uh, Team Genie is so much better. Um, when you look at Team Genie, they just you, when you look at just their athletic feats and everything, you feel like they are made for the show or this type of competition. That athletically they have everything, and that they would have a huge leg up on everybody else. But once again, the show, much more than even me and you expected, man, is that 
this show is much more about technique than it lay, let, it lets off. Like, you can't just get by on your athleticism and, and speed. You really have to know what you're doing for a lot of these obstacles. And I really, really appreciate that. And I feel like that was kind of the story of this particular matchup. Well, that I think that's one of the arguments for keeping the Ring of Fire, which, mm-hmm. you know, is problematic to some people that watch. The Ring of Fire is a pure test of ninja skill. Like, they are not getting past that by luck or just athletic, you know, general athleticism, it's going to be tough. They need to have good body control. They have to be able to kip. They have to be able to, you know, they have to do all the things that we expect the ninjas to be able to do. And they do it like to a person, they are able to complete it. It might take some longer than others and some can breeze through it. But I I think that's a, a really good test of true ninja skill, if you want to call it. Yeah, perfectly said, man. Couldn't agree more. This matchup was also pretty one-sided. Brett blew through the course. He looked really strong. David ended up doing a flip into the water on the floating tiles. Melanie ends up falling on the cargo net uh, just before Mary Beth falls on the floating tiles. Well, Mary Beth got ahead, didn't realize Melanie had fallen, and she fell right after her. And then uh, Thomas ended up falling on the floating tiles. I love that matchup in that race. Travis hitting the last floating tile just ahead of Thomas. When they both hit that tile, it's so exciting. Seeing two people race under those floating tiles is like, who's coming out the other side? Dude, wasn't that amazing? Like, I love this particular obstacle so much just because we get scenes like this where they're just neck and neck against each other. And how it was how awesome was it to see Travis Rosen just completely cut off t- poor Thomas Stellings, where Thomas had like no shot. He's like, oh, I'm screwed. Like these are the obstacles that I absolutely love when you get this kind of like mergence, right? Where basically if they're about to run into each other, they're going to run into each other, and you just have to, you know, just be as fast as you can. And it made for some great TV this particular episode. Shout out to Travis Rosen, really like keeping up with somebody not only a young gun in thomas dillings but he might be one of the fastest competitors in the entire sport and travis rosen stayed right there with him so big ups to that guy man just amazing for his age and i can't even say for his age right like and i think about yeah. it just like in general like dude is amazing yeah he he doesn't even need a qualifier it's not like wow he does really well like as if you know if he sets his walker aside he can do pretty you know make a pretty yeah. good attempt at it you know, the guy is amazing. He is far and above. I mean, he he wasn't just keeping up with Thomas. He was leading him. He was ahead of him. Mm-hmm. And and if you guys remember, just two years ago, Travis Rosen was talking about retiring from the sport. I mean, how crazy is that? And now he's just, like, been beast-moding Team Ninja Warrior like crazy. I mean, if he feels like he's done from A&W, he needs to at least, keep like, stay with Team Ninja Warrior because he's been doing so phenomenal. So, Team TNT, clean sweep again. Now, the Wings have to face Mega Crushers. It's like Team Genie versus the Wolfpack. Just say that. Oh, my God. <laughs> Team Genie versus Wolfpack. Yeah, we'll, we'll give them the better names. How about that? <laughs> it, it's so frustrating to see this. I thought, that is like the worst draw you can possibly get. I was just like cringing so hard for, for Thomas and his team. Like, all right, so we just got beat out. We have to immediately run the course again, and we have to face the Wolf Pack. Like, not, and we're the rookie team. Like, nothing like having the odds stacked against you. Yeah, but I must say, I mean, production. I I am too keen on how things happen because I watch too much reality like television in general. As soon as Dean Yader said, "Oh, we're gonna beat this team," I was like, "All right, well, <laughs> yeah. you guys lost. I now know exactly what's about to happen." And sure yeah. enough, like <laughs> Dean Yeager goes right into the water. I'm like, "Yep, yeah, good job." If you're on a reality show, never, ever say you're going to beat the competition. Never say that. Well, to be fair, this isn't exactly scripted either, right? So it's, generally speaking, he's probably pretty safe in saying that, but... Mm, He still shouldn't say it. The only time you could say something like that and be completely confident is if you're the champ in the A&W Fantasy League and say that you're going to be a two-time winner. That's the only time you can be that confident. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. This season, you are going down. If it's not me... I'm telling you, someone is taking you down this The season. champ is here, and he's going to stay here. Don't make me play my theme music. Oh, I am going to find some theme music, and we're going to throw down. <laughs> the Anyway, this matchup was really, really good. Right off the bat, it was jarring, because Dan, after after uh, a little bit of trash talk there, basically, ends up falling right on the ring of fire early in the course. 
I did not see that coming, man. No. Like, Dan is so strong, especially from the wolf pack. Like they have they're known for their grip strength. I, I was stunned. So the wings get their first victory, their first win. Oh, sorry, their first round anyway. Then we have Megan versus Melanie. It's like I, I'm pretty sure I knew how this was gonna go. Yeah, <laughs> um, or Melanie. Oh man. <laughs> Like, <laughs> she's struggling a bit this episode uh but megan ends up missing the warped wall in the first attempt for a second i thought maybe she wouldn't be able to make it up there that there was something going on other than just being winded uh, but she did get it on her second attempt uh, as melanie fell on bungee road yeah i just thought she was winded honestly yeah. but i mean valiant attempt from melanie i mean she was really exhausted and she kept like pulling through so I, I have to at least give props up to Melanie for getting as far as she did against a really tough competitor. Against somebody else, she might have uh, beaten them. Yeah, she did, she did good, and especially you said considering who she was racing against, it's pretty uh, it's a pretty tough draw. Yeah. So we had the big matchup. I was really excited to see how this was going to go. Thomas versus Ian, and it's probably been one of the best races I think we've ever had on Team Ninja Warrior. How I perfect, freaking man loved this race like they were neck and neck and going like the whole race and then anytime somebody would get a little bit further all of a sudden the guy from behind would come up like it was so close it was amazing and right down to the wire they're going up the the wall and thomas ends up getting over quicker and knocking him out it was very very close and very very cool to watch dude it was just so amazing like and not just that i mean these are two of the like super high level competitor like um youthful i guess competitors when you look at like the the people that are un- in their 20s on american ninja warrior i mean these guys are at the top of the heap and it was so fun to see them just fly through this course and yeah it was just that small last where like ian dory was ahead of thomas stillings going into that warped wall but yet thomas stillings was able to get up that faster just like pull himself up a little bit quicker and that made all the difference I mean, that was phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. And I got to give props up to both of them. I mean, they laid it all on the line. And there, there were some crazy moments. Did you notice, like, from the bungee cords up to the bungee bridge, like, Thomas Stillings pretty much, like, lachade past, like, two of them and landed, like, halfway onto that bridge and got a little bit further than Ian Dory on that. And then Ian Dory made this huge dismount, like, halfway through that bridge. I mean, they were doing some really athletic things, but they're going so fast. I don't even know if half the people caught that. Oh, I caught it. It was really cool to watch. I was, like, not missing a second of it. Man, it was amazing. It was amazing, and I gotta... I hate to take anything away from it, but this... This does kind of illustrate the issues that we had last season and still kind of have with the point system that a team can pretty much lose all the races, but the team captain can like (laughs) just win two and they're into the finals. That what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, But he didn't have to win two. He just had to win one because Dan fell on the ring of fire, right? Like other than this win, this narrow win, their other victory was because Dan Yeager fell on the ring of fire. Basically. It's tough, man. I mean, I feel like if there's any solution to it, and I don't even say think they have to do this, but if they ever am considering an alternative, I think they can really look towards Ultimate Beastmaster and their point system. I feel like there's something there that they can um, maybe take in terms of, um, I don't know, some suggestions. Maybe a point-based system might work better. Yeah, I don't know. I there's there's pluses and minuses to both sides. I mean, if you go point based system, obviously there there can be this deficit where it's not as entertaining in the second half. Where like, oh well, this team's gonna beat them out by points, but it, it's it's a tough draw. It, it really is. You can go back and forth between um, how you feel about it. Yeah, it's it's really tough, and I I don't have a suggestion to fix it. So I I guess that's where I kind of fall down with criticizing it too much because at the end of the day, you don't want any races that don't matter right mm-hmm. you you don't want people two people sitting in the starting line going well it doesn't matter who wins right this ma- this race is meaningless and the f- current format means that every race is important every race has meaning so i mean that's probably the best way to have it yeah i mean i don't mind the format as much as season one just because i feel like the teams are a lot more balanced and i think that um has more to play with it so i'm fine with it but we're still just two episodes in I very much am holding on to I can very much change my mind (laughs) later on in the season (laughs) if I just see a lot of like, oh, man, this is ridiculous. So so we'll see. 
I mean, we're, we're two episodes in. I, I have a feeling everybody's going to know our opinions on it by the end of the season. There's a chance we might we might share our opinions a few times. Mm-hmm. So with that, that left Team Tarzan versus Team TNT. Starting off, we had Brett versus Travis. That's the 5-6 versus the 6-5. I did not think about that, but that's true. <laughs> <laughs> did you see them like side by side? How ridiculous was that? But yeah, so Brett versus Travis to start the whole thing off. Brett fl- uh, flew through the b- bungees, had a great dismount, and ended up winning the whole thing there. I mean, Mary Beth versus Rose. Both of them fell on Bungie Road. They were swinging the wrong way and banging into each other. It was the craziest, one of the craziest runs we've seen, I would say. Yeah. I First of all, Brett doing handstand push-ups at the top of the warped wall after oh, that run. I mean, next level, good on him. But once again, just showing just how beast mode that dude is. But also, I, I have to say, I'm just glad to see Rose Wetzel on this show and Mary Beth. She's, they're, they're both great competitors. And I don't know. I feel like on this episode, they might have been a little bit overshadowed by Megan Martin because she, she just like she's so high level. She kind of ha- perceives as giant shadow. <laughs> but th- both of them are n- like great athletes. And yeah, I'm, I'm glad to see them. Yeah, yeah, I enjoyed it. I, I had no complaints whatsoever. I thought that was a great run. Was rooting for both of them. Didn't really have a favorite of those two. Oh, I was rooting for the Spartan. I'm sorry, but Spartan I, all I the way. I knew you would be. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of liked the mom. So, I mean, I was kind of a sucker for that part of it. Mm-hmm. So, in the end, we had Travis versus Ben, the two team captains. And Travis just blew through the whole thing. He one shot at the ring of fire and just made a mockery of the whole course, just beginning to end. Travis is the guy that just makes this a whole chorus look like a joke. Like, it is, like, nothing to him. Uh, if there's one competitor, which is shocking me for, for me to say, but if there's one competitor that has shown no, I guess, struggle on any of the any of the obstacles on this course, it's Travis. And if we go pound for pound, kind of like a fighter in terms of an athlete for the show, I think Travis might, Travis might be at the very top of the heat. I mean, he's really stood out in this entire competition. I'm trying to think of who he knocked out last season. Team TNT had some really tough um, competitors. Weren't they the team that knocked out um, G-Force? Possibly. I think they were one of them. They also, if I remember correctly, didn't Travis have to race? Didn't he have to keep his team alive by no- taking out Flip Rodriguez and J.J. Woods? I think so. I think he took... I think he defeated them back to back, if I remember correctly. Like, that's that's insane. And then we moved on to the relay showdown between Team TNT and Team Genie. They uh, they went kind of a little off. They they did start with the women, as we often see the teams do. So they had Melanie versus Mary Beth to, to start it all. But in the middle, they decided to put their captains. We had Travis versus Thomas in the middle portion of the course. And then Brett and David taking down the uh the final leg did that strike you as odd as it did me no actually i found i thought it was perfect i mean the entire reason david is on that team or i shouldn't say the only reason but the main reason they they kept alluding to was that he's so upper body base whereas thomas is lower body base and if you remember last season on american ninja warrior the part where thomas stillings was eliminated was on the salmon ladder so you want, I'm sure Thomas is really good on the salmon ladder at this point, but you want a competitor that's fully confident in it. You don't, you don't want any question marks going into the relay. And with Team TNT, I feel like Brett and Travis, you know, can be interchangeable. They're, they're both strong in their own uh, facets, but I'm pretty sure going into this, Brett was probably a little bit stronger um, for that. And also, we have to think about the closeness and proximity to the previous run. And just remember that Travis Rosen just ran his run. So he might be a little bit more winded. And you might want to have the competitor that had a little bit more of a breather go into the final part of the relay. Yep, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, can't argue with that. Uh, so it was a pretty good showdown. We had it was over as soon as <laughs> poor. Uh, come on, I mean, I'm trying to be fair. I'm trying to be nice. Uh, it was it was that that 10 second gap, like that 10 second penalty is so severe, and I don't even know if it's a bad thing because honestly, if you fall in the water, I mean, eh. But it's gonna it's gonna take a big like screw up on the other team to to make up that that difference. 
Yeah, 10 seconds is just a lifetime in this course. I, I don't see anyone ever making it up, although they almost did, really. They they really did close the gap really well. When you look at it, Melanie falls on the Ring of Fire, so they get a 10-second penalty, and that doesn't start right away. That starts after the other team tags. They have 10 seconds to wait before they can run. So how do you feel about that? I mean, do you think it's easier for, like, th- there could be the other way, right, where Melanie just waits 10 seconds and then has to complete her portion or do you think they should just um go like skip right on to the next side i'm okay with how it is because if it's a competitor like melanie or like a a, not her but another competitor that just can't get past one obstacle i mean it's going to make for a really crappy relay it's not going to be really good tv but i can understand some people if they have um, some problems with that yeah, I, I've tried to think of another way to do it, and I, I don't really think there's a better way. I think the 10-second delay. It's a five-second delay, second penalty, if anything. Five seconds, I feel like, is enough. isn't enough. Like, really, you don't want to have it seem like a good option to drop in the water if you're lagging behind, right? You need to make sure mm-hmm. that it's a, always a bad idea. Yeah, I guess it all depends on if you want to make it fair or better TV, right? Because to be fair, it's perfect how it is with 10 seconds. It's a big penalty, just be, and it should be because it's a relay and somebody completely couldn't do the obstacle. If you want better TV, you need to make it shorter, so therefore the, the teams are a little bit closer in proximity. But I'm fine with how it is because it is a competition and it should be fair. So 10-second penalty, it's a, big, it's a big penalty, but, you know, if you can't, can't get past an obstacle i mean them's the brakes right right but I, i'm just thinking like with a five second penalty if you got hung up on the first ring of fire hook and the other person goes through the whole thing you might as well just drop right then right you're gonna lose it you're gonna get more than five seconds behind just by hitting that first peg probably mm, that's a very good point yeah touche man uh, but it's unfortunate, but yeah, you, you have to have a strong penalty. Otherwise, it takes away the whole team aspect. It has to be that the team does the course and does it well to win. So yeah, 10 seconds is harsh, but it, it's got to be harsh. Yep. And I have to say, I mean, with David Yarder, we saw him training on a lot of the upper body things, but something as like the, the globe grasper is a completely different beast where it's a lot of grip strength and everything. And I think a lot of teams in training rely so much on the strength aspect of like, you know, doing obstacles like the same letter and everything, but something as like grip strength is like the globes. I mean, that's going to be a big deal. He struggled a lot more than I was expecting him to. So um, that might be something that he might want to train on a little bit more in the future. But I have to say the wings, they came out to play. And they went up against some incredibly tough competition. Like, when you think about them going against the Mega Crushers and Team TNT, they did quite well for themselves. So I have to give props up to the entire team. I mean, uh, good on everybody there. And they're all young, so I I feel like they're going to show a lot of potential in the upcoming seasons. Yeah, for sure. Thomas did a fantastic job. He actually managed to close a good portion of that gap. They were actually Mm -hmm. both on the Salmon Ladder at the same time. But Brett pulled away, unfortunately, and like you said, David ended up falling on the Globe Grasper. So Team TNT ended up winning, uh, and we're moving on to the finals. So yeah, I'm, I'm glad to see them in the finals again. And it, they're they're so I don't know when you when you think of the team Travis Rosen, Brett Sims, and Mary Beth Long, and you put them against the the more I guess um, fancier like names that you know everybody talks about, like Joe Morosky and all that, and the teams that at this point haven't even made it you know like you know when you think about the like the competitors that they were up against even in this episode with megan martin and ian dory i mean this team doesn't stand out in terms of the namesake but they really deserve that because they are so good and they're now two times in the finals and these competitors, I, I feel like the more they're going to be on, I, I first of all, I really hope this is like the final team because I hope Travis doesn't decide to like switch out his team again. <laughs> I mean, um, this team, in a way, they can be the, the Cinderella story coming up in Team Ninja Warrior and really make a namesake for themselves. If they aren't going to make a namesake, well, Travis, like when I say this, by the way, Travis Rosen obviously is a namesake in American Ninja Warrior. Right. Don't, don't roast me in, in the Twitter, okay? <laughs> but... I'm saying is like Mary Beth and Brett Sims, even though they're veterans, they can really make a huge splash in terms of boosting up their namesake on this show. And I'm rooting for them in many aspects. 
And also, somebody like like Thomas Stillings, this show is made for him, and I'm really excited to see him just go in, on American Ninja Warrior again and just be spectacular and see him on Team Ninja Warrior. I mean, if he does decide to switch up his team next season, could you imagine a team with Thomas Stillings and Daniel Gill? Yeah, I oh kind my. of half expected it this season. I was expecting it too, but man, that that is a team. If they decide to like team up, that is a force to be reckoned with. Yeah, I, I think that would have been a better way to go, but I guess they wanted to spread them out a little more, hoping for maybe a matchup between them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so moving on, we have Ultimate Beastmaster episodes 7 and 8 to cover. Uh, and I was happy to say that it, it did pull me back in again. I did have a kind of a lull there with episodes 5 and 6, but 7 and 8 were great. I was fully engaged. Shame on you. Ah, I, it might have just been the week. I was just not in the mood for it, but <laughs> it, it was 7 and 8 were great. I uh, definitely enjoyed them. Overall, same impression for you? Yeah, man. I mean, I love this show. I was really expecting, like, by this point, even before this point, I would be, like, completely done with the show. Like, oh, it's so drab, whatever. But man, the way it's the way they approach the show where they switch up little things every episode with how their approach really makes a big difference. And I have to say, the hosts cannot be understated on this show. They make all the difference in keeping the show much more fresh. So overall, I'm really enjoying the show still. And we're going into the final episodes after this. So like all around, thumbs up on everything about this show. <laughs> it's so fun. Now, um yeah, well, what were things that stood out to you, man? So, t- looking at episode 7, I guess, first, I will mention, I always like to try to cover the USA competitors, at least. So, for USA, there was Brandon Douglas, uh, parkour guy. Very top-leveled parkour guy, actually, from what they said. And Mimi Bonnie, uh, CEO slash weightlifter, which you don't see every day, I guess. Uh, was not a good episode for USA, though, because Brandon fell like almost immediately and that was probably one of the most shocking falls i think i've seen on the show i mean i didn't even care to remember their names because i'm like whatever <laughs> <laughs> they built him up they kind of did the the horse abs thing a little bit but i think he is legitimately a really good athlete that had a really good shot on the show I'm sure he is man but if you're if you're not even like making it like somewhat far into even the first stage not worth my time in remembering there's so much better personalities on this episode than team usa and one thing i really appreciate about this show or at least the approach to it is that it isn't so usa heavy it's very spread out with all the competitors so i appreciate that where it's like oh since we're from us you know we all have to raw raw again for team usa it's it's not really like that and i appreciate that because that's true Call me unpatriotic or whatever. I'm, I'm eh. <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, from week to week, you we've definitely found times where we're cheering on South Korea for, obviously, mainly for the judges, but... I'm always going to cheer on Team South Korea. They're the best. Uh, and I will cry. I will literally cry if they're not on season two. It was a good episode for them. They had two of the top three coming out of level one were uh, South Korean. So the South Korean team were really standing out this episode. Mm -hmm. Very strong. Now, um, one competitor that stood out to me right off the bat, I mean, like a world top level rock climber on this episode. What is his name? Felipe Camargo. And right off the bat, he just seems so poised, so comfortable er with everything. And he really stood out to me as somebody we need to watch out for just because this show... Obviously, you need well-roundedness, but with his build, I mean, he's built for... Uh, like courses like this not only ultimate beastmaster but american ninja warrior and or brazilian ninja warrior if they have that Uh, (laughs) we need we need to look that up i guess man but this guy this guy really stood out to me he he's very he seems to understand obstacles well his technique was always on point and with his accolades i'm i'm really high up on this guy he went one-handed on the mag wall. I think that kind of says a lot. So comfortable, right? Yeah, he just... Yeah, he was so comfortable doing it. He, he looked like he barely broke a sweat doing the first level. He definitely seemed like he was going to be uh, doing well, and uh, he did extremely well, to put it lightly. So moving on to level two, we had Philippe still looking strong. It looked like he might even beat it, but he ended up falling on the dreadmills, unfortunately, but he did really well. Even on level two, he wasn't one of those ones that get a good lead going at level one and kind of sit back he was still pushing through the course yeah so far like really impressive by Philippe 
like two comparators that I just want to like give a shout out to. One is Ivan Zapata from Team Mexico, and he was trying to do his best Asa uh, from Sasuke impression, where it seemed like every time we get a vignette by the dude, he was crying. Like literally, we begin a vignette by him talking about his family, and he's already in tears. And I don't know it. I guess for for these types of things, maybe I'm just really a hardened person. That's terrible. But you you need a build up for tears. You can't just start completely crying because I'm like, what what's going on? Like why 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 what's going on? It, it's hard for me to understand. And um, Cheng Suk Bang, awesome name. That's all I gotta say. Uh yeah, <laughs> Cheng Suk Bang was pretty good. He actually was one of the two uh, South Koreans from earlier, along with Wool Chul Kim. And Wulchul unfortunately got knocked out uh, in level two, but uh, Chang Sook actually moved on. He looked absolutely exhausted though when they lowered him into the water. He was in the uh, he's in that tube. I don't. It makes my heart race watching that tube lower into the water with them in it. Like anxiety, right? That that's oh. terrifying. Like when the water starts getting towards their feet, I am like, if they fall back into the water, they're basically stuck. So it is terrifying. <laughs> I'm sure there's precautions. I'm sure there are things that that we don't know about where they can help them, obviously. But the visual aspect gives incredible anxiety, which might be the whole point of the show. I don't know. But man, yeah, it's terrifying, right? Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't seem safe. I mean, I don't know if they have divers under there with like air hoses for them or what. But <laughs> like, I just feel like if he slid back from exhaustion, which he definitely was... Like, yeah, I, I just don't know. It seems like a... if, if you're so exhausted to slide back into the water, it's not like you're going to be like, oh, yeah, I have so much energy to <laughs> to swim my way under out of this tube, you know, so it is kind of scary, but I'm sure there are plenty of precautions. I'm sure there's a dude ready right on the side and they'll lift it up. But yeah, it is kind of scary. Yeah. Well, I mean, on A and W, we've had people fall into the water who couldn't swim. So I mean, <laughs> it happens. This is a little different, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 True. Anything else from level two? I mean, not really. Just I was really rooting for Chuck and Suck Bang. He really he was a competitor that really stood out in the first two levels as really strong, and he seemed like he seemed like they were building him up to be in the finals. So I was pretty shocked when he didn't do as well. In, st- in level two, he was still one of the stronger competitors, but I was expecting him to perhaps even go like make it all the way in that. He really came off as a very strong competitor. Right. And then we moved into level three and he really, really did not have a good jump <laughs> off of the uh, the treadmill. Can say that again. Mm. They now they made it sound like he mistimed it, but I don't think he did. It looked like he hesitated. I mean, it's mistimed depending on how you want to look at it, but to me it looked like he he had the jump ready to go and actually motioned like he was going to do it at the right time but then hesitated and if he hadn't hesitated i think he had it yeah i agree it, it kind of it seemed like he did the little double jump thing but he mistimed it and it was just like a lapse of judgment on his part that that first obstacle that treadmill is really tricky for a lot of the competitors yeah we've seen so many of them fall on it i mean a lot of them tend to recover and get back to their feet but that's panic has to set in when that happens. Like I just fell on my butt on this course in front of everyone. And now it's launching me into the water. If I don't get back on my feet. Yeah. Almost all the competitors in this episode, like almost fell on their butt immediately and then had to get back up. I think there was only like one competitor that didn't. I found that really interesting. Yeah. So Philippe couldn't figure out the whole pole thing and eventually just dropped on the, uh, the extraction point that for something that's supposed to be easy no one can do it like it's driving me crazy i want to see how that thing ends yeah that obstacle i don't care what they say on this show that obstacle is not easy they're like oh this is the easy route yeah right all right get out of here i understand it isn't it is a safer route just because you get on the obstacle and you already have 30 points and then you can just drop in the water without um losing any points so i completely agree that is the way to go if you want to keep your points and just boost up 30 points and then drop but Honestly, if I was on the show, as soon as you grab onto that pole and you're like, oh, this is too much, just drop into the water. Conserve your energy because, yeah, that's tough. Yeah, that's what Philippe did, basically. And even more so, Ludwig Heffel, Heffel from Germany did. He got to the extraction point and he just dropped in because he might as well save it for the final. He had enough points at that point. And I definitely 
wouldn't argue that point. Like that's that's one of those times when you, it's definitely a good idea to jump off the course. Mm-hmm. And uh, before we get to stage four, I just got to give a shout out once again to Team South Korea's hosts. I mean, their reaction to Chang Suk Bang falling into the water was amazing. At first, like the Korean guy host was like hugging onto his to a stool, all excited and everything. <laughs> and that falls complete blank face from the female com- uh, competitor um, host, and then the guy he's like checking his pulse to see if he's like dead. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, they're just so great. They never stop. I, I get a little. I'm getting a little tired of the deadpan. I have to say, but other than that, everything else was really funny. Either him hug, him bringing up the stool and me cracking up. Yeah, uh, they're really great. good. Yeah. So level four, we have Ludwig versus Philippe, Germany versus Brazil. I mean, I, you already <laughs> knew it was going to happen. <laughs> How could you you're, not? You're talking about one of the best like <laughs> rock climbers in the world on a rock climbing wall. I'm like, this is poor, poor Ludwig. I mean, it's not even fair at that point. It is, and it's one of the few, I would go so far as to say flaws of the show, is that, and I know we compared it to, like, the rope climb in A&W. I mean, it is, it is what it is, but it, it seems way too climber heavy. It's so heavy. On, yeah, it's so heavy. Um, I, I feel like they can, with because they separate it in four sections, I feel like they can at least start it off or have some sections in it that... I mean, I'm trying to think of ways to do it, but there there, there can be ways to think of part, portions of the course where it doesn't have to be so rock climber heavy. There is the one portion where you have the spider climb, and I understand, like, that's not so rock climber heavy. But to even get to that point, I mean, you have to be high level to get through those little slits with the fingertips. I feel like that could have been, say, for the third level, you know? Something. I, I don't know what you do. But it was really hard to complain because he actually did it. He completed the whole thing, and I was hoping somebody would be able to do it this season. Oh, boy. Yeah, I, I mean, remember the first episode? And we're like, I don't think anybody can do that. Like, <laughs> oh, are we wrong? This guy, this guy's phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. And you look at the technique that he used to get, like, he, the way he approached that obstacle, where he's looking at it, and he's just feeling it out, and just taking different steps athletically like using his body and positioning it to figure it out and it's just a remaining calm with the clock running down on him i mean this guy is amazing because i mean it takes sheer ingenuity to be that next level in understanding a circuit like that and he was able to do the whole thing and major props to him and not just that, I mean, didn't they say he got up that to even that point, the the final portion, the fastest in the entire competition? Yeah, but they also said that he made it to the first level and we and they said never seen we've never seen this before. Like, well, guys, you're kind of showing off that you're doing this out of order because we've seen people hit the top level in the very first episode. But anyway, yeah, he definitely did phenomenal and there's there's no taking that away from me. He did amazing. He must have... I can't see anybody else doing it faster than he did. He was up there with lots of time to spare. I know I alluded to a previous competitor being so perfect for this competition just because of his approach to obstacle courses. But I have to say, I mean, Philippe, if he if it's the final, like, the very final showdown, so to speak, right, for, for the prize is similar to this, he has to be at the very top. And I don't see anybody beating him when it comes to rock climbing. No, that ice climber from the first episode would give him a good run for his money, maybe. But yeah, this guy was definitely, Mm -hmm. definitely the best we've seen. All right, so we still have episode eight to cover. Let's uh, let's get the lead out here. Time to fly through it. All right, so (laughs) (laughs) you go ahead. So we had the the Kim brothers running for South Korea, Yunwon Kim and his older brother Young Young Kim. Uh, Those guys were like. uh, a major point because there was actually a fall in the practice area. The younger brother fell down while he was just working out and warming up. And I actually thought he wasn't gonna be able to run. I thought, are you kidding me? Can you imagine traveling all the way there doing all this and getting ready to run the course and just be arsing around in the practice area and then knock yourself out of the competition? Yeah, that would suck so bad. But his fall didn't seem that extreme. It seemed like more like he was winded. So I feel like they're playing up. Yeah a portion that really wasn't a big yeah, deal. Yeah, they did. They definitely played it up. 
I mean, I could be wrong. Maybe he would have broken his ribs. I mean, who knows? But it, the way the way they showed it, I mean, it looked like he just winded himself. So talking about just comparators that, you know, stood out to me. I mean, I have to say, wh- what was it like to see freaking uh, <laughs> a guy who has a Super Bowl ring compete on this <laughs> this course? I felt so bad for Isaiah Starback. I mean, this guy just stood out. It's like big guys are just not built for no. courses like this and i know we there there have been bodybuilders on the show that have done well but dude i am like didn't they say he was like 200 and something pounds like <laughs> i am like that oh that's 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 a tough build and he only made it to like was it like the second obstacle yeah or mother like tongue he fell on mm-hmm. like basically an obstacle really isn't even well you think they entered the mouth and he fell on the tongue that tells you where he was at yeah basically yeah, but the other American competitor, Jonathan Collins, really stood out to me as like somebody to look out for. A decathlon athlete and a high level one at that. And this guy was just built like muscular all around, but he really came off like he had a good sense also of obstacles. So uh, he definitely stood out to me as a really good guy. And he was very humble too, which I appreciated. Because with all of his accolades, I mean, he could have just came off like a complete jerk, right? But he didn't. Yeah, he didn't at all. Uh, I always had, like, decathletes have always been one of my favorites. Uh, I idolized them when I was a kid. Actually, specifically Bruce Jenner, was I was a huge fan. So it's it was cool to see uh, a decathlete running one of these things. So, yeah, I don't know. Not much to say about the other competitors. Kind of... Uh... This, epi- this episode was very, very USA heavy with a lot of the USA chants, which, I mean, it's getting to the point where I'm, I almost have to root against Team USA just so I don't have to hear those damn hosts be like, USA, USA. And I know I sound so anti-patriotic, guys, but it's, it's, it's too much. Too yeah, at much. times it is. Oh, actually, you know what we should mention is Team Japan had a pretty good episode going for once. Like, they've had a rough go of it. Yeah. Oh man, how could we mess that up? Yeah, they that had two up? competitors make it all the way to uh, level three. Like that's really good, really, really good. It was the happiest we've seen them. They're like dancing around and stuff. It's the most life we've seen out of that those hosts. <laughs> yeah, those poor hosts, man. I mean, the the USA or the the Team Japan hosts have had a really rough go at it. And uh, for for a little bit lesser of a point, um, Team Mexico's also had a tough time on the show, but. Yeah, Team Japan, um, they've they've had a rough go where they're, they're, a lot of their competitors are knocked out in the very first stage, so they really haven't had much screen time or much to root for. Um, it was really nice to see them um, and their competitors get much further on in this competition. So yeah, even though they had two in the, the level three and it looked like we may even have an all Japan finale, uh, it didn't happen at all because the first one fell on the treadmill and the second fell on the bungee bed, so... That sent uh, Jonathan Collins, the decathlete, uh, versus Young Young Kim. Yeah, Young Young Kim in the uh, in the finals. Uh, it was a close match, man. Like I, I honestly did not know who was going to beat the win this one. Yeah, and then Young Young Kim missed one of the point thrusters. Like it was kind of a big thing, and I thought it was that's brutal. I, I thought it wasn't that. I knew it was a big deal, but at the same time, I'm like ah, they're just playing that up because. It's not going to matter in the end. Well, it kind of did because he was slightly he higher than Jonathan. If he had hit that point thruster, he would have won. Yeah, he would have. And I'm I'm curious when the competitors knew because going down, both competitors looked like they were unsure of what was going on. And I felt like only when they like landed another, like um, they saw the reaction of everybody else where they knew who won. So it was a really tense moment, but... I don't know. That really sucks. But you gotta you gotta keep an eye out for the for the thrusters, and he just overlooked one of the very beginning ones. So um, good on Jonathan Collins because that's that's a really like impressive guy. I don't know Jonathan's chances in the finale because he's got some really yeah. tough competition on it against him. But I feel like somebody like him is probably built maybe a little bit more for something like American Ninja Warrior. Uh, on a show like this, when, when in terms of the finale and the people that are he's up against, I feel like he's going to have a really tough time, man. Yeah, I mean, they're obviously not going to have a second beast. I don't know what kind of modifications they're going to make to the beast for the finale, but we'll see. Yeah, it was fun though. I mean, it was a fun, it was a fun episode. I feel like if Young Young didn't hit that that 
like buzzer on the bottom, it would have been a really, really tense, um, like ending part. And it might've been probably the closest, uh, stage four, like, um, du- like duel that we've had. Yeah. So kind of sucks that he missed that because that would have been really tense for them. All right. So that is it for our coverage of ultimate Beastmaster. The, uh, the video that we mentioned earlier that we want to cover before we wrap this up, uh, Joe Morofsky was, uh, has a YouTube video out on Whistle Sports, and it's really well produced. Like it's a really professional video showing, kind of a behind the scenes with Joe showing him hanging around random items in his house, talking about his training. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's really interesting to watch. I, I have to say, it, it's it's something I want to share for all of you. I think you'll really enjoy it if you're a fan of the Weatherman. Yeah, it's almost like a mini documentary. It's it's short, so don't worry, guys. It's only about four minutes long. But in that four minutes, I mean, they get so much in depth with his life and um, his approach to American Ninja Warrior, his training, and they get good little interviews with his wife and his best friend and like his training um, partners. And I don't know that you you find out a lot about him in just four minutes. This is a very very compact, well produced mini documentary and. I really suggest everybody go out to watch it. It really makes me appreciate Joe Morofsky's approach to this entire sport so much more. And shout out to everybody involved with it. It was really good. Yeah, thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, and there's one other YouTube video that actually I forgot to mention to Bijan that I stumbled onto. There was a bonus run for Team Ninja Warrior, and I avoided it initially because I thought it would be spoilers. And I thought it kind of was just by seeing the title that they had... Uh, a relay showdown between Megan Martin's uh, Mega Crushers versus G Force Jesse Graff's team. Oh my God! That was the one thing I was going to talk about. It's like, oh, we never get to see Megan Martin versus Jesse Graff again. There was a there was a competition yeah, between they them. Did huh? the, the whole relay. Well, we are watching this <laughs> right now. You're about to get my in depth reactions immediately. Let's do this, bro. Where is it at? Send me the link. What's it called? <laughs> This is this is exciting. I did not know about this, dude. All right, guys. So he's gonna, Rich is gonna play the like send you all the link. Click on the link and then listen to our reactions while playing it. If you like, if you're so inclined. We got Jesse LaFlair versus Dan Yeager at the beginning, and then the one that I am just so stoked about: Jesse Graff versus Megan Martin. Yes, this is my life. I am so ready. Are you pumped, bro? <laughs> I am pumped. Absolutely. Get pumped. <laughs> It is. Oh, yes. <laughs> How could I forget? Ian Dory versus. Oh, my God. Okay. Okay. Ian Dory versus Nicholas Corridge, guys. This is this is a treat. I think they knew, like, the producers, like, we need to have them running against each other. All right. They're going to count down the clock. Now. Let's play. All right. LaFleur and Jaeger are right neck and neck. Oh, snap. Jesse is so fast. Jaeger is going a little bit ahead. What? Oh, LaFleur just beast mode at him past the, the ring of fire. What a... That, that I love because it makes such a difference. Here we go. Go, Jesse. Go, Megan. Let's get it. Jesse's got a huge lead, and she is not <laughs> no. slowing down. Oh! Megan made a big stumble. What? Dude, Jesse is beast moding this whole thing. She is not slowing down one bit. And Nicholas is just on to the next. Megan Martin's sticking right there. There she goes. So she got, like... Both girls went up the warped wall first try. No joke. Nicholas is just going flying up that salmon ladder, but Ian Dory's catching up to him, actually. I mean, Ian Dory's just full on upper body. This is amazing. Oh boy, they're close. Nicholas Corey just blew ahead, man. Jumped right ahead of him. It's coming right down towards the, the invisible ladder. They're neck and neck. Oh! Nicholas Coolridge is beast moding Ian Dory. Who saw that coming? Me. I saw that coming. Wow. Wow. Oh my God. Yeah, Ian Dory is completely like blasted out, like gassed out. And Nicholas Coolridge just beast moded it. Wow. So yeah, uh, G Force is looking pretty good. Yeah, dude. They. They are looking quite strong. This made me feel so That's happy. That's amazing. I can't even begin to describe it. I was like, oh, my pick is good. 
hey man, may- maybe they're having this matchup, this bonus matchup, because both teams are knocked nope. out. Nope, nope, didn't happen. It, it could be that. <laughs> this was after they won. They thought, okay, you know what? Let's see how they would have done against Megan if she had made it through to the end mm-hmm. like they did. We'll see, man. But I have to say, G Force looked incredibly strong. Wow, what an amazing matchup there was between that. Yeah, I, I have to say, I'm really loving the Ring of Fire. I mean, what a what a breaker that is. Um, it's kind of like a, a roadblock that a lot of the comparators have to go be- through, you know. And it um, made quite a difference. It's in the this first relay. time we've seen Megan Martin fun. have that any kind fun. of trouble on Team Ninja Warrior at all. Yeah, Megan Martin had quite a little uh, a little stumble on the uh, the bungees, but she really she made up for that quite quickly. I, I have to say, it wasn't so much of a detriment that. Uh, most people see when it comes to the bungees she she had a, a stumble but she still stayed yeah. on the pads and um just continued to see poise and flew through it so good on her because i feel like a lot of other competitors would have panicked in that situation well now i'm sweaty uh i don't know i was i was all up into that so Woo. uh so yeah that was a great find i'm i'm very happy to share it with you and now you get to to relive it with us <laughs> that is it for this week if you'd like to reach out to me, you can find me as at Ninja Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. You can email me at rich at ninjapodcast.com. And Bijan, how can they reach you? Hit me up at Twitter and Instagram at Bijan151. That is B-I-J-A-N-151. So once again, thank you all for listening, and I hope you have a great week. Peace and love, y'all.